don't want to keep um, Dr. Byrne too long um, and away from your work. So Rob, maybe we'll start this. Um, just give you a little bit of background. You know, um, we started this CATH conference during COVID. Um, as a, knowing that you know our fellows were not going to be able to go to conferences and we're going to miss out on teaching, and it's just become a fun thing to do. So we've continued it through, and we'll continue it throughout the year, uh, this year. And you know, and I think you saw from the list we've had a lot of friends and colleagues who joined in to help. So we really appreciate you mm -hmm. joining too. Um, and, I, and I'm delighted you'll talk about, you know, a topic me and you have been in many sessions about together, recent mm -hmm. osis, but a, a, really, a really relevant topic, um, particularly here in the US where I'm working. Um, I mean, at least, you know, we see really stenosis still about 10% of PCIs here. Um, and we could talk about that in the discussion. So the way these sessions are run, it's usually me and a fellow uh, who moderated together. I think you may see Theo there um, on one of the pictures. Uh, he's one of our interventional fellows, and at the end of your presentation, he will moderate the questions that come in through the chat feature. Obviously, you can see them too. Um, so, um, thank you, colleagues, for joining. Uh, we're really honored to have Robert Byrne uh, from Dublin, who'll talk to us about restenosis. It's all yours, Rob. Well, thanks, Azim. And uh, before I forget, afterwards, uh, we also have instituted a similar initiative in uh, Dublin. So I'll be reaching out to ask you to reciprocate. And uh, it's something that we just switched to uh, overnight at the end of March. And it's uh, become a very popular and a very effective way of communicating and teaching. So uh, I look forward. Uh, I'll be in contact uh, with you about that. <laughs> So good morning, everybody, um, and uh, it's a pleasure to present uh, from uh, Dublin. Uh, Azim had asked me to talk on a practical evidence-based uh, approach to the treatment of instant uh, restenosis, and uh, my colleague uh, Roisin uh, uh, Colleran has uh, helped me uh, to prepare some of this uh, mm -hmm. presentation. It's timely uh, because uh, we're uh, preparing an update of the ESC EAPCI chapter on instant restenosis. So we had an opportunity to update the uh, literature search and uh, I hope in the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes uh, to give you uh, an overview of instant uh, restenosis uh, and focusing mainly on uh, treatments. Um, as you can see from the agenda here, I thought I'd start by saying a few introductory words on uh, incidence mechanisms in etiology, then look a little bit at classification. And there are quite a number of assessment algorithms now doing the rounds. And I've just picked out one or two, uh, which I think are more useful. And then I look at treatment in two parts, what I call lesion preparation and destination uh, therapy. Um, and uh, then to uh, sum up with a couple of take home uh, messages. Uh, these are uh, my uh, disclosures. So in terms of incidents, we talked about it there in the discussion, and this is a systematic review that we did for the European uh, Commission as part of uh, ESC EAPCI working group, where we looked that time at 158 uh, randomized control trials. Now, without getting into too much uh, detail, you can see if uh, you just concentrate on revascularization here in the bottom left, that the switch from BMS to early generation DES to new generation DES resulted in significant uh, reduction in TLR. And if you look at the headline result from uh, trials, even all comer trials, uh, you'll see you're seeing 3-4% uh, rate of uh, TLR at 12 months. But of course, that doesn't capture the full picture because these patients typically have uh, long life expectancies and have to live a lot longer with the stent than 12 months. So uh, in uh, the ISAR test four trial, we recently extended a follow up and did 10 year follow up of uh, ISAR test four. And uh, I'm uh, showing it to you just uh, to show you the 10 year TLR rate. And uh, what you can see if you look at a uh, uh, 10 year TLR is uh, that uh, you're seeing rates that are more of the order of 16, 17, 18% out to 10 years. Now, 
uh, we don't have so much tenure follow-up of randomized trials and be aware that this really was an all-comer uh, randomized uh, trial uh, with 90% plus of patients at the enrolling institution uh, involved. And if you just look at the red curve, which is new generation uh, DES, you can see that really you're seeing quite a considerable rates of instant uh, restenosis if you follow these patients out uh, long term. This is a recent paper from American Heart Journal looking at a pooled analysis of six trials. Just to make two points, really, if you look at these uh, six contemporary randomized control trials, the TLR in yellow accounts for about half of TLF. Um, and uh, that uh, TLR, as with TLF, tends to really accumulate with time, and you're not seeing evidence of a clear uh, plateau effect. So I think uh, instant uh, restenosis is a significant problem and accounts for a not inconsiderable amount of our cath lab uh, workload volumes, as we mentioned in the uh, introductory remarks. So if we look then at etiology and mechanisms in terms of etiology, you can divide basically causes of instant restenosis into mechanical and biological causes. If you look at mechanical uh, causes, this is a rather uh, dramatic example of stent under expansion. But I think it's fair to say that stent under expansion is one of the most frequent causes, mechanical causes of instant uh, restenosis to a greater or lesser extent. And here's an OCT uh, example from an OCT registry that we ran in Munich with obviously a very uh, marked uh, stent uh, under expansion with multiple uh, layers of under expanded stents suggesting that the underlying problem was never really dealt with and further layers of uh, metal just to kept uh, accumulating at uh, the uh, site of the minimal luminal uh, area. Uh, many publications have shown that a uh, small uh, MSA or under expansion is a risk factor for restenosis. I won't go into those. Other potential mechanical causes or causes that fall under the mechanical umbrella uh, would include residual plaque burden, residual edge dissection, sometimes the snow plowing intramural uh, hematoma, and they would all be uh, fall under the remit of the mechanical causes of instant uh, restenosis. Stent fracture, of course, is the other uh, major group of uh, 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 mechanical causes of instant restenosis. A nice case report of a double stent uh, fracture here uh, from uh, a group in uh, Leuven, which they ultimately solved with uh, lithotripsy. Uh, there is also a recent uh, publication of a couple of years uh, back at this stage proposing a classification uh, system of, uh, of stent uh, fracture, uh, starting with a stent fracture just due to one or two struts and then uh, um, uh, going through various stages of complexity uh, through to complete uh, transverse uh, stent fracture with uh, displacement. And I think stent fracture is something that we appreciate in our everyday practice that still is an important cause of instant uh, uh, restenosis. So if you uh, uh, look then at the biological causes and say, well, what about instant restenosis that's caused uh, not by obvious mechanical causes. Uh, here, there's definitely two uh, types of tissue that you tend to see. One is the bare metal stent, typical instant restenosis, and the other is the DES instant restenosis. The bare metal stent is this classic high smooth muscle, muscle uh, cellularity, uh, moderate proteoglycan content uh, instant restenosis, and I'll show you a slide uh, on that. It's most commonly diffuse. It tends to peak at around about six months. And neoatherosclerosis, when it complicates this type of restenosis, tends to occur rather late. In terms of the classical drug eluting stent, uh, instant uh, restenosis without a mechanical cause, often you notice uh, low smooth muscle ce uh, cellularity and high proteoglycan content, particularly when it's one of these unexplained early biological instant restenosis that we occasionally see with DES, more common uh, uh, focal and neoatherosclerosis sclerosis tends to occur uh, frequent uh, and early in the course, giving rise to some distinctive OCT uh, uh, appearances, which I'll mention. Here's a, uh, some uh, pathological samples uh, from my colleague, uh, Michael Yoner, who worked at CV Path, as you know. And uh, you can see in the upper panels, drug eluting stent in, stent stenosis, and the lower panels, bare metal stent stenosis. And the bare 
metal stent restenosis, as we highlighted on the last slide, tends to be this moderate proteoglycan uh, cell rich uh, neointimal uh, hyperplasia in the majority of cases, whereas DES in stent uh, restenosis here in a relatively well expanded stent, as you can see in the low power uh, magnification, uh, tends to be comprised this more heterogeneous, uh, less proteoglycan um, and uh, 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 heavy staining here for fibrin, early cholesterol cleft formation. So a more complex heterogeneous uh, population. And you can see this is definitely a breeding ground for neoatherosclerosis that tends uh, to occur then in subsequent follow-up. Um, this is the appearance of neoatherosclerosis or some neoatherosclerosis-like appearances on OCT. And I show this really as a word of caution uh, because uh, you, uh, we, we still have some gaps in our knowledge in terms of uh, what OCT can tell us about neoatherosclerosis and the top uh, left and the bottom right, I would uh, say to you are more classical neoatherosclerosis here in the bottom right with a ruptured uh, uh, plaque as part of the restenotic uh, tissue. And here is this uh, layered uh, high signal intensity uh, in the superficial layers and then some signal dropout below that. Whereas the uh, uh, more heterogeneous uh, pictures in the bottom uh, left and the top right, I would say we're not completely sure that they are neoatherosclerosis, and we did do some uh, uh, correlation work with uh, pathology that suggests that in a proportion of these cases, particularly in the upper uh, right, uh, this might be the, um, the proteoglycan-rich cell-poor uh, uh, DES instant restenosis that we see that actually uh, doesn't comprise large uh, components of neoatherosclerosis. So I think uh, not everything that looks heterogeneous on OCT is uh, neoatherosclerosis, and maybe we should be just aware of that. Um, in terms of classification, then I won't dwell on this too long, just to say this is the restenosis pattern classification that we have used in terms of focal uh, and uh, diffuse, of course, the famous Mehran classification. And the thing I would tell, say about this uh, classification, although it's, uh, it's dated now more than 20 years old, it is clearly associated with clinical uh, outcome. If you look here at the one-year event rate, focal, intrastrength, uh, IS, intrastrength diffuse, proliferative, and occlusive, you're seeing these uh, increasing uh, rates of recurrent uh, restenosis uh, depending on the morphology of the instant uh, restenosis. So I think it's still a useful uh, model uh, when we talk about classification of instant restenosis, realizing, of course, if you look here at the treatments that the patients received in the 90s, when they were included in these studies, we recognize that a high proportion of them received uh, uh, treatments that we wouldn't do nowadays because DES wasn't available back then and neither were drug-coated balloons. So with those caveats, it's still a useful classification and probably the one that's most frequently used. This is one that uh, Ron Waxman's team have uh, proposed and I uh, show it to you because it has some attractive uh, features uh, classified from types uh, one to type five. Uh, type 1 uh, mechanical, type 2 biological, type 3 mixed, type 4 CTO, and type 5 are these problem patients with more than two layers of restenosed uh, stent. Type 1 then subclassified into underexpansion or stent uh, fracture, which would be the two most common causes of mechanical instant restenosis that we mentioned earlier. And then the uh, type 2 classified as 2A due to classic neointimal hyperplasia, and type 2B or 2C is neoatherosclerosis with or without without calcification. And I think this calcified neoatherosclerosis is something that we do see and can be quite challenging uh, to treat. Uh, and I didn't go into that in detail in the uh, interest of uh, time, but I think a useful uh, way of thinking about uh, instant uh, restenosis, the suggested treatments here might be a bridge uh, too far. Some of them will intuitively uh, make sense, some of them uh, uh, not, but uh, it may be a classification scheme that we hear more about. But at the moment, uh, I think we need a little bit more information and uh, a little bit uh, more uh, data concerning the association with subsequent uh, clinical outcomes.
The other way we have of classifying uh, instant restenosis is according to the intravascular uh, imaging appearances of the tissue type. And you'll be aware that you can classify uh, the uh, tissue as homogenous, heterogeneous, layered, uh, attenuated, or uh, classical uh, layered. And some of these correlate well with neoatherosclerosis. Some of them correlate well with uh, neointimal hyperplasia, but it's by no means uh, a straightforward uh, correlation. And we don't really have studies at the moment to say if you see tissue type A, then uh, treatment B is better than treatment C. Um, and I think it's something uh, that we would like to ideally have more uh, studies on, and maybe we can come back to it in the discussion, because it's definitely uh, a missing uh, treatment gap as dedicated studies looking at tailoring treatment strategy, depending on the signal intensity or appearances of the tissue type on instant restenosis. So in terms of an assessment uh, algorithm, of course, this is the key to the treatment. I'd, I'll propose one assessment algorithm to, uh, to you from the European Association of PCI, which is available uh, ahead of print in Euro intervention at the moment. And this is a, a rather more straightforward algorithm than some of the other ones that are circulating. And uh, I think it, it makes uh, sense as a construct uh, to guide us when we're faced with a patient in the, uh, in the cath lab. You can see that intravascular imaging is a central uh, component in the uh, treatment algorithm. And that goes with the guideline uh, recommend, uh, recommendation, which give a class two recommendation in favor of intravascular imaging for stent uh, failure. And uh, the uh, algorithm uh, proposes uh, to look at the underlying mechanism mechanism to look at lesion preparation and to look at final uh, strategy or destination therapy, as I called it, in the overview of the uh, of the talk. And uh, we look in terms of uh, intravascular imaging then at uh, four areas in particular, stent under expansion, loss of mechanical integrity, neointimal hyperplasia, neoatherosclerosis being the more biological, and these two on the left being the more uh, mechanical. Uh, look at uh, the uh, predilatation uh, strategy, uh, then realizing for the mechanical mechanical causes, we might need a more aggressive predilatation strategy, including non-compliant balloon, very high pressure balloon, lithotripsy, atherectomy, uh, and uh, the biological causes may be just requiring more straightforward lesion uh, preparation. And then the uh, destination uh, therapy, which certainly in Europe and hopefully soon in the United States, uh, is uh, comprises either drug coated balloon angioplasty or repeat stenting with drug eluting stent in stent uh, restenosis, uh, drug coated balloon uh, angioplasty perhaps being prepared and preferred for focal ISOR, for a first presentation with ISOR for reasons we'll come back to, for ISOR of bare metal stents or where there's already multiple metal uh, layers, and uh, repeat stenting with DES, which might be an equally uh, valid uh, approach depending on what the result is like after lesion preparation. Um, <clears throat> they uh, might be preferred in diffuse IS or a suboptimal predilatation result with lots of tissue flaps, for example. Uh, if there's loss of mechanical uh, integrity, I think it's de rigueur to put in uh, another stent rather than DCB or a failed DCB strategy in a patient coming back with a subsequent instant restenosis, uh, having been treated with a DCB the first time around. This is a second algorithm, and uh, for obvious reasons, uh, in the interest of time, I wouldn't plan on going into it in too much detail, but it builds on the uh, classification scheme from uh, Waxman's group that we looked at, type 1 mechanical, type 2 biological, type 3 mixed, type 4 CTO, and type 5, these recalcitrant uh, multiple layers, uh, ISOR. Uh, it's published in uh, CERC uh, interventions, and you can go and have a look at it in more detail, but it is a little bit busy, and uh, some of the uh, treatments proposed are, are not well supported by large amounts of clinical trials data, which is a little bit of a general problem in instant uh, restenosis, and we could also discuss this aspect afterwards. So it, it's there if you're interested, uh, but I would uh, propose to you that the EAPCI uh, algorithm that, I look, that we looked at on the previous slide uh, might be something uh, that's uh, better suited to day-to-day -day, uh, clinical uh, use.
So if we go and look at the uh, treatments then in a little bit more detail and look at some of the evidence that's available, uh, if you take the first step, which is the uh, lesion uh, preparation, uh, here, uh, there are a number of approaches to lesion uh, preparation, remembering the mechanical uh, side uh, of the algorithm will require more aggressive lesion preparation uh, than the biological side. Uh, and of course, uh, you may wish to start with regular semi-club compliant uh, balloons or more frequently non-compliant uh, balloons uh, for uh, low complexity, mainly biological instant uh, restenosis. Uh, patients with significant underexpansion uh, may require treatment with super high pressure balloons. And in Europe, uh, the cis balloon is a balloon that we commonly uh, use. It uh, facilitates dilatation up to 55 uh, bar. And this can be useful in focally underexpanded uh, stents with underlying calcium uh, burden and uh, generating pressures in excess of 40 atmospheres uh, has a biological uh, uh, effect on the calcium and allows you to crack the calcium uh, through pressure in a safe way. And we certainly haven't uh, encountered undue uh, problems uh, with, uh, with vessel uh, perforation, but certainly that would be an important piece of the armamentarium if you have it available in your jurisdiction. Scoring or cutting balloons you could lump together. I've just taken this uh, slide in relation to scoring balloon catheters, which are more frequent in many cath labs around uh, Europe, uh, angiosculpt, NSA alpha, which is uh, one that uh, is uh, quite deliverable, and the Scoreflex, uh, also uh, a uh, catheter that's uh, very uh, deliverable based on uh, uh, scoring elements or nitinol wires, uh, allowing you to uh, dig into the restenotic uh, plaque and uh, has an important role in facilitating lesion preparation, but also in allowing medication to get into the uh, treated lesion if, for example, you're using drug-coated balloon angioplasty. And we looked at this aspect specifically in a study, ISAR Desire 4, instant restenosis, 152 patients who uh, planned to have drug-coated balloon therapy, and uh, they were randomized to uh, preparation with scoring balloon or standard non-compliant uh, balloon. And you could see when you looked at the angiographic uh, results at six to eight months that there was a slight advantage, particularly in the higher risk uh, patients uh, in terms of the angiographic appearance if you had uh, done uh, lesion preparation with the scoring balloon as opposed to uh, repeat uh, standing. So I think some evidence to support uh, scoring balloon use, albeit modest sized uh, uh, studies powered for surrogate endpoints. Uh, laser is something uh, in ter uh, is uh, something that's uh, not used uh, frequently, perhaps slightly more common in the United States uh, than in Europe, where we have maybe other tools that are available. Uh, some data available on uh, ECLA use, for instance, uh, restenosis. Uh, this is one of the most frequently discussed papers from Euro intervention over the last uh, 12 months, which we highlighted at the uh, PCO. Uh, meeting uh, uh, recently based on altmetrics. And this was uh, 81 uh, patients with instant restenosis due to stent under expansion, due to peristent uh, peri calcium that uh, perhaps hadn't been properly dealt with at the time of the initial intervention. And the patients had to have pre and post uh, PCI OCT available, 23 lesions with ECLA, 58 lesions uh, without. And then uh, patients uh, were uh, subsequently then had a stent or uh, plain balloon uh, angioplasty done uh, on their own, approximately equally split between the two groups, two sites in uh, New York. Uh, the results uh, were quite encouraging as require as regards uh, ECLA use. You can see some nice examples here of chronically underexpanded uh, stents where ECLA had helped to disrupt the calcium behind the stent uh, struts and seems to be uh, an effective uh, strategy. 61% calcium fracture with ECLA as, a uh, as compared with 12% without. Larger final minimal luminal area. Um, if you look at the fractured calcium thickness 
thickness, you're seeing a slight uh, gradient depending on uh, ECLA with contrast versus ECLA without contrast compared with uh, non-ECLA. So this seems to be an effective uh, option. Again, relatively small numbers this time, not a randomized trial, but a retrospective uh, analysis uh, with uh, all the limitations in relation to patient uh, selection that you can imagine uh, where two OCT examinations had to be available pre and post. Uh, intravascular lithotripsy then is something uh, that we're seeing more and more of as a solution for mechanical instant uh, restenosis here. Uh, a, a case uh, report from the European uh, Heart Journal uh, with a very significantly underexpanded uh, stent here. You can see very nicely on uh, OCT. And this problem appeared uh, to be uh, uh, sorted uh, in a, an elegant uh, manner with uh, lithotripsy to disrupt the deep calcium and facilitate uh, re-expansion of the stent. There are some small series uh, emerging in the literature with intravascular uh, lithotripsy. Certainly we have personal experience of it as well. And uh, it does seem to have uh, a role in certain uh, selected patients who don't uh, respond uh, to standard uh, measures for expansion of chronically underexpanded stents that are leading to instant uh, restenosis. So if you move on then to look at uh, the uh, destination therapy as I've uh, labeled it for the purposes of the presentation, essentially uh, at the moment, uh, most of the data uh, concerns drug coated balloon angioplasty or uh, repeat stenting with uh, DES, uh, realizing that repeat stenting with DES is uh, more germane to colleagues in the United uh, States. And uh, we uh, have recently published a couple of papers from the Daedalus collaboration where we said, okay, let's uh, have a look at the comparative efficacy and safety data from drug-coated balloon angioplasty versus repeat stenting with DES. There were 10 investigator initiated randomized tri trials. We reached out to all of the investigators who, and everyone responded positively and shared their data with us. So it meant we ended up with a very nice uh, data set of these 10 modest size randomized control trials. And here's the main results you can see. So if you look at TLR, there's definitely an edge with repeat stenting with drug illusion stent as compared with uh, drug-coated uh, balloon angioplasty. And uh, you can see some overlapping of the confidence intervals here, but it's a statistically significant effect if it's statistically significant effect that you're interested in. But uh, there is a price uh, to pay because uh, if, if uh, you look at death or myocardial infarction, you can see that the curves seem to be going in the opposite direction, not statistically uh, uh, significant, but uh, certainly some cause for concern in terms of higher rates with death or myocardial infarction associated with multiple uh, stent layers and how much of a problem this might become over a longer time horizon of five, six, seven years is, uh, is somewhat uh, unclear. So I would say it's certainly not an open uh, and closed uh, case. Uh, both uh, where you have access to both technologies. I think they both have a role. I would say in our practice, uh, we probably treat more patients upfront with drug coat balloon angioplasty, reserving uh, DES for lack of uh, mechanical stent integrity or someone who's come back a, a second uh, time. Uh, we did have a second publication uh, this year where we looked uh, according to stent type and, and uh, sought to examine the influence of whether the underlying uh, stent was a bare metal stent uh, instant uh, restenosis or a DES instant restenosis. And uh, what you saw is that bare metal stent instant restenosis in terms of efficacy uh, here, the drug-coated balloon really lined up quite well against the DES. If you look at uh, the uh, center panel here uh, on the left-hand side, uh, and uh, if you look at DES ISOR, it's where you uh, started to see more of the difference in terms of the hazard ratios uh, favoring DES more clearly than the overall effect I showed you on the previous slide. But again, uh, if you look at the safety, the safety effect seems to go the other way with DES and DES, uh, whereas DES inside a BMS didn't seem to be associated with any adverse safety signals. So um, uh, 
I suppose in relation to the last uh, slide, it shows that these uh, findings are more pronounced with drug illusion stent in stent restenosis compared with bare metal stent uh, restenosis. But uh, certainly there's a, a risk benefit, uh, a piece of work to be done for each patient who presents when you consider these two conflicting uh, trends in terms of efficacy and safety for DESISR, which after all is what we're really interested in. Uh, nowadays. One word on mortality. Of course, we've heard a lot about drug-coated balloons, paclitaxel coated balloons, and excess mortality in the uh, peripheral space. In the coronary space, we didn't see it. In Daedalus, we did a specific analysis looking at mortality, and uh, uh, really, uh, to uh, summarize, didn't see any strong uh, mortality signal one way or the other. This is a meta-analysis of uh, Scheller, uh, that uh, we were involved in uh, as well. And uh, this also uh, failed to detect uh, at a study level any noticeable uh, differences uh, in relation to mortality between uh, DCB versus uh, the other group of balloon angioplasty or repeat stenting. Uh, you will have heard quite a bit about seralmus uh, balloons. Uh, you could, of course, uh, adopt uh, the approach or the opinion that there's no smoke without fire. And we've had enough problems with paclitaxel over the years. If you look at the paclitaxel illusion stents and the taxis in particular, which appeared to have somewhat inferior efficacy and uh, uh, certainly inferior safety compared with uh, limus uh, illusion stents and saying, listen, all things being equal, the seralmus uh, coated balloon therapy would be preferable. And uh, a number of these uh, devices have, have uh, received CE mark approval for use in Europe, including the Magic uh, Touch, uh, the solution which recently uh, got CE mark uh, and had undergone some testing in an Indian uh, population. Uh, results presented at TCT last year looked uh, quite encouraging and they've had CE mark on the basis of that as far as I understand. There's also a bilimus A9 uh, coated balloon which uh, attempts to solve the problem of uh, drug retention. Uh, that uh, is usually an Achilles heel of uh, limus uh, coated uh, balloons by using a more lipophilic uh, uh, limus uh, drug in biolimus uh, A9. And uh, we're starting uh, a study uh, looking at uh, biolimus uh, A9 in, uh, in, uh, in coronary vessels uh, in a randomized uh, trial. And I'm pleased uh, to say that we've uh, recently enrolled our first uh, patient in Spain. Uh, it's a multi-center, multinational uh, uh, trial, and uh, we're hoping for first patient in here in Dublin uh, also in the coming uh, weeks. And uh, one other technology you might have heard about is a, is, is a, uh, a really seralimus eluting balloon. I suppose we use mainly the term coated uh, balloon because these balloons generally are just coated uh, with an excipient uh, and an active drug and don't elute medication. But this seralimus eluting uh, balloon really is a, an illusion balloon through uh, micropores uh, where you uh, inflate the balloon uh, in the vessel after doing your lesion preparation and uh, elute uh, seralimus through micropores. And uh, this is also reaching uh, uh, clinical uh, uh, testing. And it looks uh, like we're going to be having uh, more data on uh, this device that uh, Terumo have acquired an interest in uh, in uh, the years ahead. Uh, one uh, device that has randomized control trial uh, data available already, and there is just one at this uh, point, is a balloon that's been developed by the manufacturers of the sequent uh, Please balloon, the first paclitaxel coated balloon, and they compared uh, uh, their seralimus coated balloon with a paclitaxel coated balloon in 50 patients with DES ISR and saw uh, comparable results really in terms of the angiographic efficacy at uh, follow-up at six months late luminal loss, 021 with the sequin please and 017 with the seralimus coated balloon. So I suppose the take home is that there's a lot of activity in the seralimus coated balloon phase um, uh, 
after we had a, a gap, I suppose, of about 10 years where it seemed we'd have to make do in the drug coated balloon space with just paclitaxel uh, for reasons uh, related to uh, pharmacodynamics and, uh, and logistical considerations of drug delivery, but lots of progress in the last few years. And it seems likely that we will have uh, a selection of sirolimus coated balloons available to us in the near future. So this is uh, just uh, to uh, finish by showing uh, a case of uh, DES-ISR with some uh, imaging. And this is a, a patient who'd come back with multiple instant uh, reach stenosis uh, with two overlapping uh, stents in the right coronary artery, a relatively focal pattern instant uh, restenosis with some uh, secondary changes further down uh, stream. I showed you the OCT image from this patient in one of the earlier slides, uh, which uh, you may have appreciated. And you can see, if you look at this rather focal area of instant restenosis, it's certainly fascinating in terms of uh, the heterogeneity of the uh, tissue typing with this areas of uh, high signal intensity and low signal intensity. And I mentioned that we actually are not sure that this is neoatherosclerosis, but probably this DES associated hypocellular uh, proteoglycan rich instant uh, restenosis. But stent expansion here, as you can see, and in intravascular imaging is relatively good, indicating this is primarily a biological. Uh, problem, no evidence of stent fracture or stent uh, gap. This was a patient who was treated in the ISAT Desire 4 trial that I showed you earlier. Lesion preparation with balloon angioplasty. The idea is to deliver the drug coated uh, balloon um, uh, only to apply medication to the area that you've uh, already dealt with with standard uh, balloon. And by facilitating passage of the drug coated balloon, also uh, you have less loss of medication from the surface of the balloon while you're bringing it uh, into the coronary vessel and delivering it to the uh, region uh, to be uh, treated. And that's one of the important things that we've learned with drug coated balloons that we have to pay particular attention to surface coating integrity uh, in terms of manual handling of the balloon on the table with careful attention to detail when you're prepping it, leaving it in the sleeve, uh, and then having uh, as little dwell time as possible when you're getting from uh, loading uh, through to guide catheter, through to delivery into the coronary vessel and making sure that the lesion is already uh, prepared. You could say perhaps a somewhat underwhelming uh, result uh, after drug-coated balloon angioplasty. Uh, and if you look at the OCT, you still uh, see, and this is probably quite a, a nice picture of uh, treatment after drug-coated balloon angioplasty, but certainly it's not a, a stent-like uh, result and you do have uh, tissue uh, membranes and tissue prolapsing uh, left uh, in the lumen. You can appreciate this in the longitudinal view at the bottom of the slide. And uh, the patient uh, came back then at uh, six to eight months for an angiogram, which shows that the result is well maintained. And if you do an OCT, uh, you can see at the site where the MLA was, uh, really you have a very nice healing effect from the paclitaxel uh, coated uh, balloon with appearances that are somewhat better than they were uh, immediately post angioplasty. And this is uh, something that we see with drug uh, coated uh, balloon therapy. Interestingly, if you look uh, slightly further downstream in the vessel, uh, you start to see uh, some more accumulation of, uh, of this heterogeneous type of tissue. Uh, uh, and uh, you can Im uh, imagine that this is a process that is dynamic and may reoccur over years. This is at a separate uh, site downstream towards the end uh, of, uh, of the stent, but I think goes to illustrate uh, how these patients uh, can uh, run into further problems uh, down the line. This is early stage change, of course, uh, which doesn't require any intervention. So uh, to sum up then, uh, I thought I'd uh, just uh, highlight uh, briefly guidelines uh, and, uh, and leave you with the take home algorithm. So in terms of guidelines, this is the ESC guidelines of myocardial revascularization. And they give us a green light, a class one indication for both repeat stenting with DES or for angioplasty with uh, drug coated uh, balloons. Of course, uh, they co and they give both of these level of evidence A because of the randomized control trials that I discussed, uh, which contributed to the Daedalus project. And uh, if you look uh, at the recommendation uh, for patients with recurrent episodes or diffuse instant stenosis, of course, CABG uh, may be considered uh, by the heart team over a new PCI attempt. And I think that stands to reason. We won't 
and don't expect to have randomized control trials looking at that, but that's a sensible uh, uh, grounds, I think, for a class 2A recommendation. And the final recommendation, specifically in relation to stent failure, uh, regards intravascular imaging. We should be liberal in our use of IVIS and or uh, OCT to detect uh, stent-related uh, mechanical problems and uh, weed out the mechanical problems from the biological uh, problems which cause uh, restenosis. There's an array of uh, uh, features uh, of useful information you can get uh, from intracoronary imaging of stent failure, uh, which will help in your classification algorithm according to mechanical or biological uh, causes. And uh, I think in terms of the algorithms uh, that I've uh, seen uh, published over the last couple of years, uh, the algorithm from the APCI uh, uh, consensus document, uh, I think is an algorithm uh, that's uh, quite straightforward, focuses on intravascular imaging, divides up your causes as mechanical or biological, uh, stent under ex expansion, loss of mechanical integrity, uh, going down the mechanical pathway, and uh, biological causes don't, going down the biological pathway with uh, an option for drug coated balloon angioplasty if it's available in your jurisdiction or repeat stenting uh, with DES. And you can decide this on a case by case basis uh, um, based on uh, some high risk uh, features, which we went through earlier. So, with that, uh, I'll thank you for your attention and uh, look forward to answering any questions you may have. That, that was great, Rob. Um, thank you. I think you, in a, you know, short period, summarized years of work and uh, an area that both of us have worked on quite a lot and interest us. You know, while I'm waiting for Theo uh, to join um, and give you some of the questions from um, the chat, and um, one of the things, you know, I, I, thinking about these two algorithms, and I agree with you, I, I like the. Um, the EAPCI algorithm, it's really easy to follow and remember. Um, but the important thing I think for people to note that at the heart of both of these algorithms is intracoronary imaging, right? I think intracoronary imaging, I mean, even though the European guidelines give it only a class two it's never gonna get class one because I don't think we, any of us would ever agree to a randomized study uh, where I, I wouldn't agree, where I would not use intracoronary imaging to understand the mechanism of restenosis. So it's probably always going to be class 2A. Uh, it's interesting in the, in the US guidelines, I've not seen it in the guidelines for restenosis. Um, but I really think, you know, to highlight for the fellows that it should be your standard of practice that if you see a restenosis that you want to treat percutaneously, you should be doing imaging first uh, to understand the mechanism. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, that was one of the central uh, messages uh, that I hoped uh, to discuss based on the uh, presentation. And, you know, if you're an IVIS cath lab and uh, everyone likes using uh, IVIS, then use IVIS. If you're an OCT cath lab and you prefer to use OCT, use OCT. Um, realize, of course, that some information, and maybe some cases of stent fracture, the information uh, from the angiogram will help you a lot. I, I, stent fracture is something, of course, now we have 3D reconstruction algorithms with OCT, which assist us, but sometimes it can be a little bit challenging, uh, even on intravascular uh, imaging, and of course, careful uh, 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 angiography and looking at movements throughout the cardiac cycle can give you important information, and we shouldn't neglect that, but I think intravascular imaging uh, is an important uh, adjunct for all patients with stent failure, be it stent thrombosis or instant uh, restenosis. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, go ahead, Theo. It's all yours. Yeah. So first of all, I would like to thank you, uh, Dr. Byrne, for the, your excellent presentation. And really important topic. And as we see more and more, uh, you know, during our first months in the cath lab, many patients are presenting with uh, instant restenosis. One general, uh, one general comment before we go to more technical factors, um, and that's my personal opinion, is that I feel sometimes that we don't really also pay attention to the patients, like meaning that we focus on the uh, on the resistant ISR or ISR uh, under expansion or or other reasons. But also, I feel that uh, the patients that come with the same similar same uh, risk factors, similar le high levels of glucose, cholesterol, smoking, they're still you know they, they haven't lost any weight. So do we have any data about that? Like uh, in your, since you have done so many trials with instant stenosis, have you had any, any data about if there is any changes in the patient's you know, risk profile? 
Yeah, I mean, certainly it's a very good uh, uh, point. And uh, when we're discussing with patients uh, undergoing PCI in the first time, we're telling them, of course, that this uh, PCI deals with the consequences of your disease process, but it doesn't uh, attack the underlying disease process. And uh, that's uh, where, of course, secondary prevention and optimized medical therapy come in as an adjunct uh, to PCI. Um, I think... Uh, we don't have a good handle if you look specifically at instant uh, restenosis, and I know some research groups are interested in it, and there have been proposals uh, to look at, uh, for example, PCSK9 inhibitors in patients with neoatherosclerosis uh, to see what happens to those uh, down the line. The problem with instant restenosis is the patients who uh, require intervention uh, then obviously have, have have a reset of the process uh, because the uh, critical stenosis is uh, is dealt with. But um, you know you can look uh, retrospectively uh, at uh, at data sets, or uh, you know you can build in a maybe in a factorial design in the future uh, something like. Uh, uh, very aggressive uh, lipid lowering therapy with PCSK9 inhibitor uh, after you uh, the patient has been treated according to uh, standard uh, standard practice. I suppose we're treating everybody uh, to very low cholesterol goals anyway in terms of LDL cholesterol less than 1.8 in uh, millimoles per liter or 1.4 millimoles per liter in very high risk uh, patients. And I think you multiply that by a factor of 39 for the US milligrams per deciliter. But uh, it, obviously it's um, we, we do uh, encompass very aggressive secondary prevention recommendations for uh, our patients in general when they undergo uh, PCI, but it's definitely an area where we could do with more data and with more specific uh, studies looking at it um, uh, going forward. Mm. There have been numerous studies over the years, Rob, that looked at um, you know systemic therapies, uh, oral therapies for restenosis, but I certainly don't remember any of them being convincingly positive. Um, you know, trying to inhibit all different mechanisms of intimal hyperplasia and fibrosis, but um, as far as I remember, none of them have really been effective. No, I mean, it's true. I mean, uh, you know, there, there, there are, like you said, there's lots of studies from uh, various uh, vitamins through uh, oral serolimus, through uh, probucol orally, uh, and uh, nothing, none of them uh, showed uh, dramatic uh, benefit in terms of uh, reducing uh, subsequent uh, restenosis. Right. I see. Um, one other question is that uh, uh, since, you know, we all agree that imaging is very important, like OCT and IVUS, and unfortunately I have to say that, and I think, I don't know how it's in the U.S., the majority of the hospitals or the cath labs, they don't really use the OCT and IVUS. Can you give us like a very briefly the pros and cons of each imaging uh, modality, like uh, how would you choose between IVUS or OCT? Um, in the setting of restenosis. In the setting of the restenosis, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, well, as I said at the outset, I think, you know, you can make a case for either, honestly, and uh, it depends with whatever your uh, uh, your cath lab is most uh, comfortable doing, but I think you should do one or the other. Um, if you have uh, both, I think for instant restenosis, if you want to look not only at mechanical factors, but also look at biological factors, then of course OCT offers a superior resolution and that can give you more information. Now, at the moment, you'd have to be honest and say it's mainly of academic interest rather than of practical interest because we can't say this patient has a more heterogeneous uh, biological type of restenosis. They should be treated with repeat stenting uh, instead of drug-coated balloon angioplasty. This patient has a more homogeneous signal intensity uh, to their tissue. They might do better with uh, drug-coated balloon angioplasty. So we don't have that information, um, but uh, hopefully we will uh, going forward. Uh, but uh, I think, so you, so you could make, uh, the argument that although this information is nice to have, how much it changes the real clinical uh, um, uh, management is open to question. IVUS, of course, doesn't have this uh, degree of uh, uh, spatial resolution, but it does offer you slightly superior vessel sizing. Now, there are algorithms for OCT to improve your vessel sizing, uh, and they're 
uh, moderately successful, depending on how much residual plaque is proximal or distal to the region of, uh, of interest. And of course, you can make extrapolations. Um, but you know, uh, vessel sizing is arguably a, a critical factor in instant uh, restenosis, a frequent cause for stent failure. And if IVUS had an edge there, you could make a case to support IVUS. I mean, the last two factors to consider, of course, are renal impairment, where you'd go more for uh, IVUS if the patient has advanced renal impairment, impairment and left main stem, ostium instant restenosis or mid-body instant restenosis, where you may prefer IVUS rather than uh, OCT. I see. Mm -hmm. uh, one more question is that uh, uh, you, in your presentation, you nicely uh, demonstrated the differences between the um, ISR patterns uh, among uh, bare metal stent and drug eluding stent. We, do we have any data uh, among the drug eluding stents, like a first, second, or fourth generation uh, drug eluding stents? Is there any differences or similarities in the ISR pattern? And if there are differences, how does uh, affect uh, you know the treatment uh, options? Yeah, I mean, we don't have strong evidence uh, to suggest difference between the different second generation DES. If you look at the studies, and if you put focal and multifocal all into one pot, you generally in the DES studies tend to see about 60, maybe 65% of focal and 35% uh, diffuse, which was a switch from what you saw with bare metal stents. Uh, but we don't have good data to say with a biodegradable polymer DES, uh, when you see more focal um, or with a permanent polymer, you see more diffuse. So. Uh, so we don't have that degree of data. Personally, I don't uh, think from my experience that there is uh, substantial differences in terms of the restenosis morphology that you see. Uh, though it does remain uh, a notable gap and uh, would be very interesting uh, for a project uh, of pooled data sets to uh, really look uh, you know, uh, with a, a, an offline analysis exactly at the morphology of incident cases of, of TLR, but I don't think there will be a difference. I see. Okay. Um, so um, one other question, and I think is also very related to Manaf. Uh, Manaf is also one of our fellows, and he asked a question about uh, the drug coding balloons and drug eluding stents. You saw in the, I think it was in data loose meta-analysis, that drug coding balloons are similarly effective to drug eluding stents for the treatment of bare metal stent in stent stenosis. However, there is some increased mortality uh, when you treat it with, for a dr uh, drug eluding stent, ISR. What's the explanation about that? Do we, um, like why the drug eluding balloons, they don't work so well for drug, uh, drug eluding stent eyes? Well, I think also so, maybe, you know, the more important question that Manaf is asking, why is there that hint of increased MI and mortality when you put a DES in a DES? Yeah. So I, th I think it's important uh, to be clear. So we talk about efficacy and we talk about safety. Now, uh, of course, they're only names, but if we talk about safety and we look uh, mainly at death or death in MI, uh, what you're seeing is a, sl a, a signal uh, towards increased death or MI with uh, DES in DES. You're not seeing it with DCB in DES or DCB in bare metal stent. Now, what's that due to? Well, uh, I mean, the working hypothesis is that it's due to the adverse effect of multiple stent layers, multiple polymer layers, multiple layers of medication. Um, is it particularly a robust observation? I don't think it's a particularly uh, robust uh, observation. It might uh, be a, uh, a chance finding. Um, and uh, we do need to dig in, and I know we will do in the Daedalus mat analysis, and look a little bit more at, at the type of DES that was put in the second time around. And often we don't have it uh, for the first uh, stent that uh, Riester knows. We might know it's a DES, but uh, we sometimes don't know exactly what type of DES. But we will uh, have in that data set exactly what the type of DES was that went in the second time. And uh, we are preparing an analysis on that. And that will be uh, the next uh, paper to come out of uh, Daedalus, hopefully in the next uh, month or two. And I'll be able to answer that question. Uh, better, but the short answer is it seems to be some adverse uh, signal of stent in stent, and we saw it in <laughs> Iser Desire three at three years follow up. We saw it in PEPCAD China ISR during late follow up. Azim, uh, I mean you saw it in De Novo a little bit yeah, in 
in in your studies in a later term uh, follow up where there was some divergence that we couldn't get a great handle on in modest i mean all of these studies are moderately sized uh, studies so we need to be cautious of, against over interpretation but there does seem to be some smoke there maybe not fire but some smoke mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's one question about uh, if you have any experience with the OPN uh, non-compliant uh, balloon uh, used like in calcified or uh, lesions or double uh, stent layers with under expansion. Yeah, so that's an easy one. And the answer is we use the OPN balloon all of the time. It's a very valuable tool. It's a little bit more bulky to uh, deliver. It's very good for um, uh, under expanded uh, stents. Um, and uh, it now in the, in the newer version goes up to 55 atmospheres and it's, a, it's an important piece of uh, cath lab uh, kit, which seems to be not associated with any adverse uh, uh, safety. And the main limitation is uh, deliverability, but uh, that's uh, quite good. We did do a study where we looked at lesion preparation in calcified lesions, not in uh, chronically underexpanded stents. And uh, we presented uh, results of that. It's called ESAR Calc. And it compares lesion preparation with scoring cutting balloons against OPN balloons. And uh, that's uh, a manuscript uh, that's under review uh, at, uh, at present. Uh, but uh, the OPN balloon certainly seems to perform uh, well. Yeah. I had great experiences with it as well when I worked in Europe. Um, it really saved us many times, you know, from getting out of yeah. difficult situations. And people, you know, and I, the reason I like the balloon as well is because it goes against this whole concept where people are scared of pressure when you're using a balloon, right? Because it's not it's not the pressure that breaks vessels; it's the size uh, and oversizing. And this balloon really stays; it doesn't get bigger yet it allows you to exert more pressure to the wall and really make the most of Laplace's law to really try and, and break calcium without breaking the artery or expand the stent. Uh, unfortunately, not available in the, in the United States, Robert. Um, we've been trying to convince the company, you know, to come to the United States, but they are a small Swiss company. Uh, so unless someone, a bigger company can help them, uh, I'm not sure we're going to see it in the United States for a little while still. So. Yeah, it's a pity because uh, the approval pathway uh, might not be so arduous uh, as it would yeah. be with a, with a new stent or a permanent implant. And uh, it's such a useful balloon to have uh, that, uh, that it seems like a pity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one question about the antiplatelet therapy. Uh, what uh, antiplatelet therapy do you use for the drug coding balloons? And uh, what's your uh, antiplatelet strategy for ISR uh, drug load stent, like do you prolong the duration or uh, you just uh, give the guidelines to see based on the presentation? Yeah, so the second part first for uh, repeat stenting uh, with DES, we tend to go by the general uh, guidelines. And if it's a stable case, uh, we'd be more likely to recommend six months of dual antiplatelet uh, therapy than prolonged. Now, um, obviously, it depends on other factors, like if it's a left main stem, instant restenosis, or a distal left main bifurcation, or who knows, uh, where, of course, you might give it uh, more prolonged based on the uh, concomitant bleeding assessment. And if it's ACS, uh, and, you know, about 20-25% of these cases are ACS, then uh, we tend to go with the standard 12-month uh, DAPT, unless there's a reason to deviate from it. In relation to drug-coated balloons, it's a bit more complicated, and uh, certainly it's an area uh, that's somewhat contentious. Um, our practice uh, is uh, to uh, give a, uh, a DAPT duration broadly consistent uh, with what we do uh, with stents, uh, perhaps somewhat shorter. So, I mean, an ACS patient, regardless of uh, whether you use a DCB or a stent, like I said, they'll generally need 12 months DAPT unless they're particularly high bleeding risk. Uh, and it kind of the focus then really comes on the uh, uh, on stable patients. And there, our practice was more three to six months, although certain people uh, and certain groups have a good experience with one month. Uh, there isn't any good uh, studies randomizing one versus three versus six. 
in a drug coated balloon uh, angioplasty. And that's, I mean, if you look at the animal studies, you definitely see delayed healing with drug coated balloon angioplasty. You definitely uh, see uh, heavy f fibrin deposition with drug coated balloon angioplasty. There is changes at the vessel wall, which where you could make an ac academic case for. Uh, standard duration uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. On the other hand, if you've got a good reason to give shorter therapy, or maybe you're using drug coated balloon because you're particularly worried that the patient has high bleeding risk, and then of course one month or three month therapy may be completely reasonable. Um, but uh, a straightforward patient who's not high bleeding risk uh, and has stable disease undergoing uh, uh, DCB angioplasty for ISOR, we tend to give three and more commonly six months DAPT. Yes. Um, there are some uh, questions about like a, a different uh, mo modality strat uh, treatment strategies like uh, the, brach the role of brachytherapy, rotational therectomy, and the laser. Can we just briefly talk like uh, maybe some of few indications of for each of these uh, strategies? First, starting yeah. with brachytherapy. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, these are strategies um, uh, that uh, that may have a role. I mean, recalcitrant, uh, instant uh, restenosis, maybe bracket therapy will help there. It depends. I mean, if it's just mechanical under expansion that's chronic and hasn't been dealt with at the time of the original intervention or the first time that the patient comes back, then um, I'm not sure uh, if bracket therapy is going to help you more there. Perhaps uh, laser, if you have it in your cath lab, um, or lithotripsy uh, that uh, we mentioned. And I told you we've had uh, a couple of uh, good experiences where the lithotripsy has got us out of trouble with chronically underexpanded stents in, uh, in recent months. Um, I, think, uh, I think that can be a, a good uh, approach. Um, so I would say vascular brachytherapy, A, if you have it or have access to it, fine, that's the first prerequisite. And two, maybe a recurrent biological type of restenosis rather than uh, a mechanical problem. Uh, with ECLA and with lith lithotripsy, there the niche is chronically uh, underexpanded uh, stent due to calcium that wasn't properly addressed at the time of the first uh, stent implantation. Rotational atherectomy, I didn't cover. I mean, there's some things I didn't cover. I didn't go into vascular uh, brachytherapy in uh, much detail because uh, a limited number of people have access to it, realizing, of course, that uh, there is a little bit more access in the US than uh, other places. Um, but uh, rotational atherectomy is something that's occasionally necessary uh, for calcified instant neoatherosclerosis, which uh, we've all seen from time to time and can be really challenging uh, to treat. And you can rupture all the non-compliant balloons you have in your shelf and maybe you've got uh, OPN, um, but uh, this kind of sheet-like um, uh, calcified neoatherosclerosis that tends to happen uh, many years after implantation of the index stent is a tricky uh, problem uh, to treat um, and uh, mm -hmm. might uh, occasionally require something like rotational atherectomy. Uh, Rob and Theo, thank you so much. I think maybe we're going to start wrapping up here. Um, I'll just make maybe make a final comment about the brachytherapy in addition to what Robert said is, you know, I remember when I first, uh, and you probably remember too, Robert, when we started our fellowships years ago, there was still some brachytherapy available in Europe. And as blood-coated balloons then became available and we started seeing the efficacy data, it almost just completely, I mean, brachytherapy disappeared. It's extremely challenging in Europe to find a center that still offers brachytherapy. Uh, in the United States, though, you can. I mean, you know, in New York, there are a couple of centers that offer brachytherapy. Um, obviously, Ron Wexman, you know, in Washington still does. And there are a couple of centers around the United States. And I think part of why we still offer it here in the, in the U.S. is because we don't have access to drug coated balloons uh, for the coronary. Um, but, you know, for my our colleagues out there who are from the United States, there are at least four drug coated balloon studies that are supposed to start this year. So if you're interested, you know, reach out to Boston Scientific. They're going to start a study with Agent. Um, so is B. Braun going to be starting a study with, um, with Sequent Please here in the United States. Uh, Terumo with the Cirolimus uh, balloon you're talking about. Um, are also starting a study. So we'll see a few studies, hopefully this year. It'll still probably be a year and a half, two years before we can get FDA approval because you've got to finish the study, get follow-up, and, and then you can get FDA approval. But I think the fact that the FDA now has given 
breakthrough designation to a number of these balloons, particularly the Cyrillimus coated balloons, may give them a fast track to approval. And, and I really, I got to admit, you know, when I think about the differences of working in Europe versus the United States, uh, one of the devices I miss on an almost daily basis is having access to a drug coated balloon. Um, Rob, uh, Theo, thanks so much. That was great. Um, thank you all for attending. And, and Robert, as always, I always learn from you. And thank you for taking the time. Um, I look forward to paying back the favor. Very good. Have a nice day, everyone. Will do. Thank you. Okay. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.